Hello and welcome to lecture number two of Research Methods in Finance. My name is Stefan Eriksson and today we're going to be taking a look at the OLS assumptions and diagnostics tests. And let's just drive, dive straight into it because, well, we already wasted enough time of me doing all kinds of silly stuff. So this week we're going to be taking a closer look at all these assumptions that we actually introduced last week. As we know, there's five of them and the thing was you only needed four of them to be satisfied in order for the OLS estimator to be blue. That is, it's the best linear unbiased estimator. But why do we have the fifth one? Well, remember the fifth one we need in order to do, well, hypothesis testing or inference as some would call it. They're known as the Gauss mark of assumptions, if I haven't said that already, and we are going to just drive through every single one of them with uh, maybe a little exception of the fifth one, because I can kind of already say that. Uh, typically for financial data, we have large samples and therefore the fifth one, we don't, at least in practice, don't care about too much because we assume things are asymptotically normally distributed, but I may come back to that later. And again, if something is unclear, you just ask and I'll get to it as fast as I can. Mm -mm. Now for the Gauss Markov assumptions, we're going to take a look at what happens if they're violated and more importantly, how can you actually detect it? And well, even more important so, then you would see how we can actually fix it. You will notice very quickly that all of these assumptions, they involve the error term. And that may you think about, well, what's so important about it? Because, well, we can't even really see the error term. Because the thing is, we observe only the residual, which is the estimated error, right? Because you don't really observe the error term itself, right? So we have to estimate it. And all these things here can be rather troublesome. But it also means since we don't observe the error, we will have to perform all these tests that we are about to show in today's class on the residuals. That is, we don't do them on the error, but the estimated error of the residuals, which of course is the difference between the actual and fitted values of your dependent variable. Now that should be a good uh, introduction to what it is we're going to do. And we're going to dive straight into the first assumption. And again, for those, now I have even the book here behind me here, such a nice book, isn't it? I hope you guys have read it because remember, all the stuff that is assigned reading is examinable material. That also means that suppose I don't really cover in the lecture because I forgot. That doesn't mean it doesn't cannot show up on the exam. I would like to, you know, stress that a little bit extra. Go for the first assumption. That is the most straightforward one, maybe besides the fifth. But the thing here is we are assuming here that the average value of these errors or the residuals is zero. And the thing is, we will never, and I repeat, never violate it if we just include a constant. I've into included a little picture up here where you can see what happens if we don't. Notice that the dotted line is if we don't include a constant, because what happens if we don't? That is, we are forcing whatever regression line we are drawing to go through origo, that is 0.0, .0 because there's no intercept. No intercept means it's zero. And whereas the solid line would say represent the actual one, if we would include a constant, then you can see it actually fits the data better. Whereas if we have to follow the dotted line, it's the best it can do, but it will be horribly, horribly biased. So all the estimates, it says it can be biased. Often it will. What do I mean by can? Because there are some situations where it doesn't. And that is, of course, if the coincidence happens that the line would go through 0, 0 0.0 anyhow. And the second thing is here, the, given the way R square is defined, not including a constant may even turn your R squared out to be negative. And uh, that's pretty bad. So the bottom line here is very simple. Just include your constant and you're good to go. So we don't even have to really deal with this assumption in practice, as long as you just include a constant. Now, that was actually number one. So that was quick. So let's go into something more fun, because now we're going to have to start practicing these so-called very difficult words, starting with homoscedasticity. And the thing is, what are we assuming? We are assuming that the variance of the error term is constant. In other words, it is spherical. That is not a fancy word for it, but we just say constant variance, right? You see that the var here of ut is equal to sigma squared. So some constant finite number. And the thing is, what is heteroscedasticity? First of all, that is the case if it's not homoscedastic, so the opposite, right? That is that the arrows do not have a constant variance. And uh, you can start practicing the word heteroscedasticity, 
And I also think for fun, I've included it here as a little point reward because then, uh, well, then you can see me try to say it 10 times fast after each other. The thing is, it comes in two flavors. The first flavor is that the variance will change with one or more of the explanatory variables. That is, the variance depends on the value of your x variables, your independent or explanatory variables, you would call them. This is what we're going to be dealing with this week. However, there's also another way of this, and that is that it changes over time. So now here we're assuming that it just varies with explanatory variables, but not time. The time aspect, we're going to look into lecture four, where we really dive into the time series behind all this here, or just the topic of time series. So first off, number one we do today. Number two, you would have to wait two more weeks for that one. And I promise you it's going to be hard enough. So what is heteroscedisticity in that? And now let's take a step to the side and actually look at a historical perspective here. I kid you not, it's been actually a publication in Econometrica. What to call it? Or how to spell it actually, more precisely? Is it spelled with a C over the K? And it's actually really fun to look back at here. And somebody actually took the trouble to actually write it out. I think it would be fun just to go take a look at it. So that's why I put it up here on screen. So um, now that was enough fun for now. Let's go into how you can actually detect it. And the most common way to do so is by using a Huber White's test or just White's test. So here we're going to go what I would like to call a cookbook method. So I'm going to simply just put it up as a recipe like you've seen a cookbook because I have figured out or I think that this is the easiest way to do such a thing in order to, you know, clearly figure out what steps do we have to take. So assume now you have a nice little regression up here. Let's put in my courses so you can see it. You can see here that we have two explanatory variables, x1 and x2. And we want to test whether the variance is constant. So we need to test it to see whether it's actually homoscedastic or rather it is heteroscedastic. I wouldn't say rather, actually. Maybe just want to see problems happen, but let's get back to that. So the first we do is we carry out the test as follows. And oh, thanks for coming in, Slowpoke, and put on this nice little chef's hat. So when you see that, that also means that we are going to use one of the cookbooks and it's a very good idea to remember how that is done. This is all I would like to say about that. So first, what you do is the simplest step. You simply just estimate the model. We estimate the given model that you see. And uh, that is that we do so, we estimate it and we obtain the residuals because of course we estimate it. The thing is we then do is that we will generate the squared residuals. So once you obtain the residuals, you just calculate their squares. So you put it to the power two, basically. Once that is done, you go on to step two. And then you run the following auxiliary regression. That is, you take your newly generated residual squared and you regress them on all your explanatory variables. So you see x1 and x2 in here. You take their squares, and that is where you see the alpha 4 and 5 here, with x1 squared, x2 squared, and the cross products finally. That is where you see on alpha 6. You then run this auxiliary regression, that's step two. Step three is then you simply just conduct a straightforward f-test of all these estimates. That is, you test whether alpha two until and including alpha six is jointly different from zero. If you then would regret, why do I say regret? Reject. If you would then reject this new hypothesis, then you have evidence of a heteroscedastic error term. That is, you reject the new hypothesis, the joint new hypothesis, that these are equal to zero, and therefore you have enough statistical evidence to conclude that you have, well, heteroscedasticity, that is, non-constant errors. Simple as that. That is the most straightforward I can do it, but uh, please remember these steps here because they will be important for later. Let's go on and see what happens if you supposedly find heteroscedasticity. What happens? First off, you actually still get unbiased estimates. Because remember here, the estimates themselves are not affected by this. So um, that is, they're still unbiased. However, they're no longer blue. How is that so? Well, that's because part of being blue is that they're the most efficient one, right? Or they're saying, uh, you know, best. Best means lowest variance. Now, when there's heteroscedasticity, they're no longer the one with the lowest variance. There may be better choices out there. And therefore, it's no longer blue because it's no longer best. Oh, I got a really good question here in the chat here from Frank. So Frank asks, if you have a regression with three independent variables, 
do you get a single cross term uh, of all these variables or three cross terms? Now you have to take all possible cross terms. So if you have three, you would do x1 with x2, x1 with x3, and x2 with x3. I think that uh, would answer Frank's question. Let me know. That's at least what I know, or at least what I think. So I think uh, that's clear enough. You're welcome, Frank. And uh, let's carry on what happens. They're no longer blue. That is, they're no longer best. And that, of course, means that the inference that you would conduct with, so to speak, wrong standard errors could lead to simply misleading conclusions. What do I mean? Suppose you have heteroscasticity and your standards are slightly, well, what's the best way to say here? They're smaller than they should be. Because they're smaller than they should be, you're more likely to reject any new hypothesis that you have, thereby concluding something is significant where it may be not. It could also be the other way around. But you can see here, you can come to misleading conclusions because your standards are not precise. And... Uh, Depending on which way, actually, it depends on the type of heteroscasticity. So I cannot say which one is most likely if they get too large or too small. All I can say is that they're not correct. That is, they're simply just off from their actual value that you wish to estimate. Whoop. So how do we get around it? There's different ways. First of all, and uh, that's actually the most uncommon, I think. At least I don't use it very often because it involves that you know the form of heteroscasticity, and that can be really hard in practice. But if you know the form, you can use GLS, a sort of generalized least squares. And uh, we're not dealing with that in this course. Sorry for that, but I would like to mention that you should still know that this is definitely a possibility or a way to simply fix or you know control for heteroscasticity, right? So that's one way. The second thing is, yeah, I know, it's generally least squared. Yeah, thank you very much. Good, good, good. Now, the second thing, and that's more commonly done, is that you can transform the variables into logs, for instance, ln logs, whichever logarithm you want to use, or simply reduce it by some measure of size. Why is this interesting? Because this form of consistency varies with the level of the explanatory variables. So if you decrease the size measure, they would also will swing less. There will simply be less variation. Less variation means also it's less likely to be heteroscedastic. That's one thing, right? So give an example. You can log transform to compress the scales. And I've also given a nice little thing here. So you can see here that, for instance, the number 80 is 10 times the number 80, but ln 80 is only 4.3. So you only see if you go to the next one, ln 8, you'll get something that's twice as large. So what do I mean by this? Jump from 8 to 80 is big. That's times 10. But jump from ln 80 to ln 8 is much, much less. So you already see you can reduce the size measure. So a lot of people, they actually take the logarithm of such a regression. Um, the thing is here, there is, of course, uh, different assumptions behind this white test here. And then we come back to the assumption of normality and also what is asked here in the chat. What about it's not normally distributed? For the point here, two things. First, check the book, but that's a lame answer. So let me help you a little more on this one. Like I said, introducing for this lecture here, most financial data we assume is normally distributed. Otherwise, inference is, well, kind of problematic, right? Because we are assuming a certain distribution. That also counts for the same way when we apply these, well, this white test here. So I hope that actually helps a bit here. I'll leave it hanging for a little bit and see if there's any response on this to the chat or in the chat. But indeed, we are just going under the assumption that we have normally distributed data. And that leads us to the third one and the most common one and the easiest one. Notice here the white heteroscedasticity consistent standard error estimates. Great stuff, because that all that is a very quick fix. How does this work? You can simply just use as a default option as data. R, even Python, any other software, basically. They all have this standard option. And if they don't have it, you can actually calculate them yourself. Good thing is we don't have to calculate them yourself here because you can just use the standard option as data, which is just comma robust. And um, now what happens here? If we have heteroscasticity, use white standard errors, we fix it. But what if we use it without having it? Well. 
turns out that it's actually also fixed. Why? Because asymptotically, they're equivalent. That means if you have a large sample size, so t is large, then the two formulas for these standards will converge or, well, coincide with one another, so they become the same. So that also means we should just use robust standard errors because then you're safe in any case. Because if you have this consistency, you fix it, and if you, well, don't have it, it doesn't matter because they should consign to the same thing if the sample size is large. So that's one very important thing. And this comes to the very good time of a nice little example, right? So here I have a nice little arbitrage pricing theory model, simplified, I would like to say. And what are we doing here? We're just examining whether monthly excess return of Microsoft stock, could be any stock, but we're just using Microsoft here as an example, can be explained by unexpected changes in a set of macroeconomic and financial variables. Again, I would like to stress that indeed we're just using a small simplified model here. Estimating a regression, you see here in Stata, the nice little rec command here, but you all know this because you all studied the material for tomorrow's tutorial, right? So you see the rec command here on our dependent variable, ERMSoft, that's the excess return of Microsoft. We regress it on the excess return of S&P 500. We have an R term here, the interest rate term, and the difference in inflation, so the change in inflation basically, right? We estimate this, this is our nice little model. We now wish to check, well, does this model suffer from heteroscopicity? Yay or nay? The way we do it, let's just run a nice little white test. We're gonna be looking at this one in practice, of course, in tutorial tomorrow, but for here, we can just see the outcome up here in your upper right corner. We see actually here that the p-value here is incredibly high, 0.92 if I can read this, they are uh, quite small numbers, I give you that. And it actually seems to hmm, not really be an issue. So in this particular case, we don't have to, but now of course, what happens if we would do? Let's just try that anyway. So what if you use standard errors anyway? The common robust slowpoke, thank you very much. What you quickly notice here, let's actually go back again. I'm gonna go back a little bit. Look at the things here, you see the p-values here. We see that it's significant at the 1% level, again at the 10% level, and then insignificant, okay? Let's go on and see what happens now when we use the robust standard errors. We see that indeed it's still significant at 1% level, now it's significant at the 5% level, and it's still, but barely insignificant. Now I did say that they coincide, so you would expect the, the outcome to be, well, the same. They are similar, but they're not exactly the same here. And why is that so, guys? Why do you think that it actually changes still quite a bit? I wouldn't say too much, but it, you will notice the change. Good thing is it doesn't change the conclusion, of course, but there are some changes here. Why do you think that is actually the case? And this is where I'm asking your chat. I see you, how many people have here? Around 20 people here. So I would like you guys to be a little awake. And uh, you know, why? Why is it that, or why do you think that we still get some standards that are slightly different? Nice little chance for me to drink some coffee also. Hmm. Interesting. It's all radio silence from your end. Or maybe you just, oh, it's also fair not to know. It's not an easy question. Let me give it here. A like, little bit of his consistency. Well, that is true, Bart, but now, nah, or maybe not, because the test said it was highly insignificant. So, not really. No, the, so that could be the case, but in this particular case, it's not, because the white test was very clear that it was, you know, highly insignificant. So, what could it be? Now, well, notice what I said about that they will only coincide if it was, you know, very large. So, indeed, you still have slightly different standards. That is indeed what Frank is pointing out here. But that was also my question. Why are they slightly different? And the reason here is the sample size is, quote, quote, only 324. I noticed, or I said to you, that they will coincide under large values, right? So... My guess here, call it an educated guess, would be here that this is still not a really large sample size. They're only asymptotically equivalent. So only these, uh, these two formulas for the standards will coincide if it was a very, very large sample. Because it's still ah, large. It is still large, but it's not very large. That's why they still are a bit different. Even though there's no significant evidence of heteroscopicity.
Is that clear for everyone in the chat? Or everybody watching, I hope? Because uh, that's something I think is rather important. So just to sum up, we found no evidence of heteroscasticity following the White's test, but the standards are still slightly different. And we can attribute that to the fact that our sample is not enormously large, so to speak. It's only 324. Carry on, because we got a lot more to cover before, well, we're ending today's lecture. Let's jump on to assumption number three, which is that the covariance between UT and US is equal to zero. And that is for any UT US that's not the same, of course, because we are talking about covariance over time. So that is, we see that there's no error pattern, so to speak, between two different time points in your errors. So in other words, we're just assuming we see no pattern whatsoever. And that's what we're trying to test here. This is known as autocorrelation or serial correlation. We use the words interchangeably, but I, pre I prefer to just use autocorrelation because as the word implies, it correlates with itself. Autocorrelation, right? And also because you're talking about correlation over time, so you're talking about patterns within the same era for the same estimation. So yeah, correlated with itself. And um, yet again, we are of course looking at their sample counterparts because we cannot observe the errors, we only observe the residuals. So we say if there's any pattern to be seen, we call them autocorrelated or serial correlated. You can choose whatever word you like, but I prefer autocorrelated. Yum, yum, cold coffee. Blah. This one here, we can actually use graphical tests first. I am not a huge fan of graphical testing, at least not for drawing, you know, sound conclusions, but they are a very, very good method of just giving a quick overview of what do you expect. Unlike heteroscasticity here, we can actually have an idea whether it is positive or negative. And first, we're going to look at positive autocorrelation. So the way you can see it, look at the first graph on your left. I think it's uh, this direction and all the way to the left for you when I point. You plot simply time t against t minus 1, and you will see this upward trend in the eros. In this particular case, that witnesses positive autocorrelation. If you will plot it just over time, you will see something on the right-hand side. <clears throat> that is, you see a nice curvature to it. It stays above zero here for a while. Then it goes below zero for a while and up again, like nice and wavy. This is strong evidence of positive autocorrelation. Likewise, we can look at negative autocorrelation. And first you look at the left-hand side. That makes perfect sense. Now it's just a downwards trend instead of an upwards trend. But then you look at the right-hand side and it may not be what you expect at first. Now this case here, it simply is a, like a flipboard. It just goes from above, below, above, below, above, below. Like relatively fast, immediately after each other. So how do you see the difference here between positive and negative? With negative, it immediately shifts sign every time. If it's strongly negatively correlated, it is, that is. And if it's strongly positively correlated, you saw that it took quite a while before it went below and above. So it doesn't change sign very often. That is the point here, okay? For further assumptions here, I'm clapping the book here in the back. That's what you can go and check if you want any further explanation of that. But I would like to leave it at that in terms of the evidence for positive and negative autocorrelation. Of course, we should also look at what happens if there's no autocorrelation. And first of all, let's look at the left-hand side. What you would see here, there's no clear upwards or downwards trend. In fact, it just looks like somebody just took all the residuals and smacked them on the wall and just pff, splat out in a nice little circular structure. That's evidence of no autocorrelation. If you look at the other one here, you see it falls somewhere in between, of course, somewhere between positive and negative, right in the middle. That is, it. there's no real pattern, right? Just like we had before, you have to observe no pattern in the error term to have no evidence of autocorrelation. And that's exactly what you see in the picture here on the right-hand side. I hope that is uh, clear. This is a fantastic moment to actually just ask in the chat because uh, this is uh, quite interesting. So I'm just going to put a nice little yay-nay poll up here and see if anybody is awake. Guys, what do you think actually? Is this clear, the way I've explained it here? 
So just let me know. I put it up in yay and nay. If not, we're just going to give it another round. I'm assuming that that was a typo because I see a two and a one. Fair point, and I will uh, neglect that. So uh, we got one vote over in nay. I should disregard. If anybody else, this is your chance also to, of course, influence whether I should spend more time explaining this or we are fine and just moving on. So if I see a lot of ones here, I'm good to go. I see at least one, two, but that was the typo, right? So we're going to neglect that. We got uh, five viewers here responding. I'm uh, going to hold it a little bit longer, guys, because I see we have 20 people actually watching. Indeed. So I would like to know. Okay. We're going to give it another round. So what do we mean by this here? Okay, guys, look at here. When you have positive autocorrelation, sorry, negative first, it's like a flipboard. It goes, it changes sign very fast, very consistently. When you have positive one here, it will, let me do that one again. Negative flips very quickly and positive, it takes a while before it actually changes sign. You see there's a clear pattern to it in that it takes a nice curvature here, nice movement. It takes a long time before it actually shifts. So that's the positive part. And for negative, it shifts very quickly. And when you have no autocorrelation, you find it somewhere in between in the sense that there's no clear pattern. It is sometimes one or two periods above. Other times it just goes straight below, straight above again. It shifts sign rather randomly, actually. So that's the case here. Now, I hope that helped a bit for, for those who was a bit unclear about this here. Otherwise, you're welcome to ask again here after class again. I would like to carry on with how to detect it. And we actually got different ways of doing so. And uh, I think here, what we're going to do here for today, we're going to cover all this autocorrelation things, and then we're going to take the break afterwards. So starting with the first method, and that's also the easiest and rather old school. That is Durbin-Watson test. It's a test for first order autocorrelation. Notice that I say first order. This is uh, funny enough, the source of most deductions in the first assignment. That was my help to you. That is that you are not specific enough. I require that you guys are specific. And if you talk about the Durbin Watson statistic, we're talking about first order autocorrelation. What does that mean? That means that time t is correlated with t minus one. There's one time period in between. That's what is meant by first order autocorrelation. Now, okay, we write it up like this. That is that you have ut, which is the error term today. You relate it to, in this case here, rho is just an estimated parameter, to ut minus 1. So you're relating today with yesterday. So that's what we're doing here. And we assume that, of course, the error term here is normally distributed. We have a nice little test here, which tests the following hypothesis. The null hypothesis being that it's equal to 0. And alternative is it's not equal to 0. Of course, if this is equal to 0, there's no relationship between today's error term and yesterday's error term, and thereby we have no evidence of autocorrelation. And if you reject it, of course, then we have evidence. And the test statistic that you have here, approximately, I say approximately because it's not actually precise, but it's a nice little rule of thumb. So it approximately equals to two times one minus the estimated row parameter. And of course, the row parameter is just the estimated correlation, and we know from basic statistics that one takes the value between minus one and one end for perfect negative correlation, all the way up another end to plus one, which is perfect positive correlation. So that means now that we actually have a case where this parameter, zero, or this Durbin-Watson parameter, can vary between zero and four. Because depending on the estimated row parameter, if, for instance, we find no autocorrelation, that is the estimated row is zero, then we get a Durbin-Watson statistic of two. If it's one that is perfect positively autocorrelated, we get a Durbin-Watson parameter of zero, or statistics, sorry. And the other end of the spectrum, minus one, if it's equal to four. Rather, it's equal to four if it's minus one. That is perfect negative autocorrelation. Roughly speaking, indeed, if we find a value that is just close to two, we say that we don't find anything. So this provides a very quick way to observe first order autocorrelation. It's a very simple test because you can just produce this value. You actually don't have to look up the tables unless you want to be precise. So 
for you guys out there, if you're just wa watching and seeing a Durban War Statistic of about 2, so say 1.9, 2.1, 2.2, 2, something like that, well, it's okay. That's close enough. But let's be a little more clear, of course, because it doesn't follow a normal standard statistical distribution. Indeed, there are significant levels for this, but um, look at it here. You find actually that you have an upper and a lower bound. We call it DL for the lower bound and DU for the upper bound. Now, I did say there was some kind of like uh, levels for this here. But what I mean is here, there's these kind of boundaries here. It's a little different. It's not a standard statistical distribution. So let me take that first. I also got another question here, but I will get back to that in just a moment. So there's indeed also an intermediate region where you can kind of not be sure what's happening. I put a nice little graph from the book, so credits to the book for that one. You can see up here in the upper right corner. What you see here, you have a region in the middle where we don't project. That is, it's close enough to two. How far away from two depends on these boundaries that you can calculate or simply look up in the back side of the book in the statistical tables. And there you can see what are these boundaries. And of course, that also produces areas that can be inconclusive. That is, you could get an air, a value of a Durban Watson statistic that doesn't really tell you anything. So it gives you a value where you say, hmm, I'm actually not even sure. And that's the downfall of this one here, right? First downfall is it could be inconclusive. That's not very nice because that gives us nothing. Second is it only tests for first order autocorrelation. And let me be clear, what is first order autocorrelation? That is that the errors today correlates with the errors yesterday. Or more generally speaking, one time period, yes, one time period apart. So if you have daily data, today with yesterday, if you have monthly data, this month with last month, yearly data, this year with last year. That also hopefully answers the question I got in the chat. What do I mean by first order autocorrelation? Please let me know if this answered your question. Otherwise, we'll have to come back to it later. So indeed, that's first order autocorrelation. And the thing about this term, what's insisting again? Yep. It is very quick and fast to use because you can just look at this produced statistic. However, it's only first order. And second, it can be inconclusive, which is annoying to say the least. Of course, there exist more general ways of doing it. And let's go for the little more general approach here. We call that the uh, Bruch, Bruch, blah, blah. Bruch Godfrey. There we go. Something like that. Test. Provide some more general test. What do I mean by more general? That is, we can test for more than just first order. We can test second order, third order, fourth order, and so on. We can just, you know, specify what order we want to test at. That is very nice. But for this one here, let's go and take a more general cookbook approach, shall we? So again, let's look at our standard regression here from before. It's the same type as we used for showing you for the heterocysticity. So we have two explanatory variables that took a little bit longer than I expected. Two explanatory variables. And we want to test in the following way. Slowpoke appears again with a cookbook. So that means you follow and you take nice notes here. So first of all, we estimate the model and obtain the residuals. That's exactly the same as with the, with the white test. Only difference here, you don't square them because we're not looking at a variance. That is, we're only looking at the first moment. So we estimate the model and obtain the residuals u hat t. What do we then do? We generate lags of it. How to generate lags? Fun fact, I actually just made a video on my Stata playlist, not uh, yeah, maybe a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, that shows how to actually do this nicely. But we're going to cover this again in the computer practicals. But suppose you are testing for three lags, then you would generate three lags of u hat t. That is, you generate u hat t minus one, u hat t minus two, and u hat t minus three. It almost rhymes, almost like in a little musical sense. So you choose some kind of lag order R. And R is three now in my little example here. And the first thing is you would then run your auxiliary regression. Notice here, you have to include your explanatory variables again. So X1 and X2. And then you regress on all these lags you have generated. So one, two, three. So you see down here in my little example here, let me put in the cursor again, it should be there now. We have the two explanatory variables here from earlier. And now we include one, two, three lags, because in our little example here, 
we want to use or want to test for three lakhs. You can, of course, if you want to do it for just two, you would just generate two lakhs and only include two. Simple as that. What we then do, we would obtain the R square from this regression. Mm -hmm. That's a little different than last time, because remember, we did an F test actually in the, in the heteroscopicity case. Here, you obtain the R squared. And then you have the following. You let T denote the number of observations. And then you have a test statistic that is chi-square distributed with degrees of freedom R. How these distribution works and stuff like that, that is something I assume known from your bachelor course in econometrics, of course, or statistics in general, right? So what you have here, it is distributed chi-square with R degrees of freedom, R being, of course, the number of lags you're testing for here. And you have that the statistic is T minus R times R squared. Then you produce a nice little statistic. What do you then do? You can simply just check it up in your little book in the back to see whether it is actually reject the null hypothesis or not. Okie dokie. Let's use an example to get a little, you know, more familiar with this concept here. So for this example, I'm going to look at a Phillips curve. Or you can actually just look at anything, but I just decided to use a Phillips curve here. That is, of course, we, infl we relate inflation to unemployment, I believe it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. But in this case here, all I see with a nice little statistical mindset, I see a simple linear regression. I'm happy because that's pretty simple. That is, we have our INF, which is in this case inflation. You regress it on the D times U, which is the difference in unemployment, the change in unemployment. So we make this regression. And what we're interested in knowing now, is there any autocorrelation present? How do we test that? Well, let's do the following. You can do the lazy version and just use the standard built-in command, which is estat b godfrey, comma lag free, lags free, y lags free. That is to include how many lags you want to test for. So here you could decide how many lags do I want to test for. In this tiny example up here, you see I decided to use three lags. You can of course just go for lags four, if it's four lags, lags five, and so forth. This is the lazy, really slowpoke way of doing it. But um, it works. But of course, I'm a little mean, so let's go in and look at the not lazy solution. And uh, because laziness is always the solution, but uh, well, we'll try and do it manually this time. So how to do it manually? We do the steps that I showed from before. We already conducted step one, right? We made a regression. We obtained the residuals. And now we generate the lags, as in step two. We want to test for order three, so we generate three lags, ut minus one, ut minus two, and ut minus three. We then estimate this auxiliary regression, which is the one you see down here. So you take e hat, that is the name I've given my residuals. You can actually just call them u hat, e hat, whatever name you want to give them. We regress that on our d dot u, that was our explanatory variable, plus our three lags, just like the recipe tells us to, right? And then we can get the test statistic, which is 90 times 0, 0.3838. 0, 0.3838 is the R squared that we obtained from this regression. You can actually see it here in the regression. It's quite small, but it's right here. 0 0.3838. Now, there's a few notes here that's very important. That is, first, Stata actually does not deploy this degrees of freedom correction R. So it doesn't subtract these three. So it just says 90. That's very annoying. And second is, you have to actually replace missing values with zeros. This is something I just figured out how to do in practice. So if you want to do this manually, you would have to do this. That's very annoying. But of course, you can just use the estat b godfrey command to get over a shortcut here, because we like shortcuts. But I still need to show you the manual way, because I also would like to under you to understand the intuition behind this test and know what steps are actually taken. So if you look in, if you want to make a deep dive into the code behind this estat b godfrey, you would actually see them do something like this, what I've been doing here, because, well, that would replicate it exactly. So in this case here, that's how you would do it. And of course, when you have your test statistic 34.54, you look it up in the statistics table under the chi-square distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom and check whether it rejects yay or nay. We are almost at the break mark. The last thing I want to do here is that we have some consequences, of course. Actually, there's two things, but this is the first one. What happens if we have autocorrelation? Well, just like heteroscopicity, we still have unbiased estimates because it doesn't affect the estimates themselves, but it affects the standard errors. 
that means they're no longer blue because they're no longer the best ones. They're no longer efficient. That is, of course, standard errors can be in different directions of the bias. Depending on whether we have positive or negative uh, autocorrelation, we can actually talk a little about which way it is. So I give an example here for the positive part, and you can pretty much figure out what happens if it's negative, right? So the thing is here, just like with his consistency, if you use these standard errors without correcting them and you notice autocorrelation present, your inference will be invalid or misleading. That is the conclusions you would draw under whatever test you're doing could give you the wrong conclusions, right? So they will not be correct. That's not good, right? So these are the things you would have to know and check for. What are the consequences? And of course, how do we deal with it? Now, let's go in and see how we deal with it. First of all, just like with the GLS approach before, this one here requires that you know the form of autocorrelation. So you would need to know is this positive or negative. That's not always super clear, but at least this is more, let me say, more clear than with the heteroscasticity case. Then you use the Cochrane or Coot method. That is not covered in this course here. If you want to actually have it covered, you should use a look at the empirical methods of economics also offered by this faculty. I know for a fact that they cover it over there. I unfortunately don't have time to cover it here. So the thing is, you would just have to know that that is a method that can actually overcome this. Second, what we can do is we can estimate the model in first differences. We're going to get back to that in lecture number four as a way to deal with this. But that's indeed a very, very general method to do. Third, you can use a lagged dependent variable as one of your regressors. That is a problematic way to do it here, depending on what type of models, but in general, it's only good if you have a very large sample size because it actually violates assumption number four, which is the endogeneity assumption. Again, that's a matter for lecture four. You can already see how this lecture four is going to be massive, right? And as I warn you, that one is going to take a lot of time. Again, we can add a trend to the model. So a variable that encapsulates any upward or downward trend, trend to the model. That's one thing we could do. So simply just add an extra regressor that represents a trend. It's not a common solution, but it's definitely a solution. And a more straightforward solution that looks very much like the robust standards from before is just use the Huck standard errors. That is, as the name implies, heteroscasticity and autocorrelation consistent standard errors. So you actually notice here, these are basically the robust standard errors plus from earlier, because not only do they cover for heteroscasticity, but they also add in a coverage for autocorrelation. Now, here's an example of how to use them very quickly. It is called the New West approach, actually. And in Stata, in order to use these hack standard errors, you would simply use the New command up here. Let me put that in here. The New command here instead of rec. And then all you have to do is comma lags six, or rather the number of lags from which you want to correct. I, in this little example here, has just used six lags. You could use free if that was the thing you would think, but that depends on the type of your data. Here, I am assuming that any potential autocorrelation here will not go beyond a window of six months. And of course, if you were to specify that there were no autocorrelation present, that is you don't use this comma lag option, they become exactly the same as the white robust standard errors. That's neat, right? So. They're all kind of related, all these models, right? All these fixes. So you can use the hack standard errors. If you don't specify the lags, you then just end back at your white standard errors from earlier. Very, very nice, right? And here, this here should actually give me a point where we can have a nice little break. So I'll see you back here at say, uh, it's a small break today. So we'll see you back here at the hour. See you back in just a bit for the next round. Bye-bye guys. Welcome back here to second part of today's lecture for assumption number four, which is also more commonly known as the endogeneity assumption. Said here, we assume here that the covariance between the error term and your right-hand side variables is non-zero. That is that, of course, they are not related to one another. There, of course, or there are actually five cases here we have to be aware of here. First of all is the relevant omitted variables bias. Second is measurement error. Third is reverse causality. And fourth is self-selection. And finally, but not least, 
zero correlation in the presence of a lag dependent variable. I'm going to address each one of these here in the second part of today's lecture, come with a more explanation what kind of situation is it, give some examples, because that's one of the improvements, of course, based on the comments from you guys. You would like to see some examples from practice to see, you know, well, where does this arise in practice? Why do I think this is so important? It's something I introduced to the course a couple of years ago because uh, it's something that master students typically neglect a bit in their thesis, which I think is very sad because it's very, very important that you address this one in your master thesis. Why? Because unlike the others, this one doesn't have a quick fix. That also means you really need to argue your case why this one is not violated and what you have done in order to prevent any such violation of this assumption. So that is why this is extremely important. Now, let's just get on to the more common one or the most common one. That is the first relevant omitted variables bias. Okay, first one of here, what happens if you don't have it here? That means you get biased and inconsistent parameter estimates. That is, you don't only get like the problem we had from earlier where it's no longer blue because it's no longer the best. No, it's not even unbiased nor consistent. That means whatever you're doing when you violate this one here, it is wrong. You can't trust your estimates themselves. That's why this one is such, well, an important assumption. In other books, it also may be referred to as strict exogeneity, of course. But that's, of course, a slightly different version of what we have written here. But overall, it amounts to the same. No covariance is to be observed between your error term and your right-hand side variables. Now, let's go on to the first one, shall we? So the thing is here, there's a nice little note here. That's very good for you, Slowpoke. Thank you very much. That is indeed that number two till five. So all the other ones is actually just a special case of the first one. So I could actually just stop after explaining the first one, but I think it's very good to go through the different flavors here and see, you know, what makes them so different from one another. But in essence, they can all be, be rewritten to be a special case of the first one. Now, starting with the first one called relevant omitted variable bias. Notice here the word relevant. I'm going to talk a lot about that in just a moment. But to explain this, Please observe this first general model. We have up here that the expected value of your dependent variable given your right-hand side variables, x and w in this case, is equal to the following, so these parameter estimates. Now the thing is here, when you, S, when you condition on the observable variables, but you omit the other part, that is you, you, ex, you look at the first one, x, but not the second one, you obtain the following. That is, you obtain these parameter estimates here, x beta. However, you still have this second part here. And the second part here is what gives you the source of this endogeneity bias. It comes in two cases. Either it is biased when this here is non-zero. Okay. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Or it's biased when this parameter gamma here is non-zero. What does it relate to? They relate to two different cases here. First of all, you relate to whether there is actually any correlation whatsoever between them. That's the first one. There has to be some correlation here. If there's none, then there's no problem whatsoever. And the second in here, it has to be, I would say, relevant. Because suppose that the first one is non-zero, that is, there exists some correlation. And that's, of course, bad. But the second one here, suppose that it's actually zero, that means it's not relevant. That means, yes, you could imagine that you estimate some model, but you forgot to include my mom's birthday in there. I could argue that's relevant because it's correlated with some of your variables. But if it turns out to be not relevant, that is that the estimated impact is, well, zero, then there's no bias, even if they may be correlated still. So please notice here, Bias is only observed in this case here if the two things here come in, that A, there is some correlation between your observed and unobserved variables, and B, that it's relevant. Relevant simply meaning that it's non-zero, this estimate here, this, you know, impact, so to speak, right? So again here, we deal with 
observed variables and everything that is not observed in your model, where does it go? It goes in your error term. You have to imagine that everything you don't put in your model, where does it go? It goes into your error term as we also explained in the first lecture. So everything you observe is one thing, everything you don't observe is the other thing which is then scooched over in the error. If there then happens to be some correlation between anything you have forgotten out there and something you have not forgotten and included, and this is relevant, then you get the bias. Let me give you an example or two of this here. So a nice little example of here is the general wage equation. That's one of the more classical examples, but now suppose that I have obtained estimates on individuals' wages from some kind of sample, now included here by wage i. We want to relate that to education and experience. Okay, that's great. These are two important variables. But now notice that in the error term, which we call tau, I'll still call it u or epsilon, now I just call it tau. Suppose here, we have that out here, but outside here, I have now a variable that I did not include because, well, I either forgot or I didn't observe it generally. And out here we have ability. First of all, is this a problem? So now we have to look at the two conditions here. First, can you argue that ability is correlated with either education or experience? I don't think it takes a lot to argue that ability is very likely to be correlated with at least education. That is, if you're born with more um, smarts, you're more likely to get a higher education. If you're born with less smarts, you're more likely to get less of an education. That's at least what the argument is to be made here, right? So that's the first one. The second in here, could you also argue that it's a non-zero impact, that it's actually relevant? Is ability relevant to your wage? I would say so. I, I think that's not a hard argument to make, right? That means by excluding this or not including ability here, we are producing biased estimates. That means we have an endogeneity bias, which is very, very bad. Now, one way around this here is that we, of course, could just include something for, you know, correcting for it, like an instrument. But this is a complete different thing that we are unfortunately not dealing with this course here today. I'm only looking together with you at the different causes of bias. When you're going to deal with perhaps this in your thesis, I hope at least, then of course you would have to dive into how you can actually get around this. One way to deal with this one, for instance, is to use a proxy, an instrument, so to speak, for ability. That could be an IQ test, for instance. But of course, other problems comes with that one, and I come back to that one in just a moment. Let's go to the second one, shall we? The second one is measurement error. It's actually one I've been dealing with a lot lately and some of the other things I've been doing. But to give you an example, again, we're going to look at the same model that we had earlier. We have two uh, explanatory variables, x1 and x2. But suppose now when I actually estimate it, I'm actually not estimating x2, but x2 asterisks. That is, it's actually the real value plus some noise. So imagine now I am observing something here. But now I notice that I'm observing with a little noise attached. And this actually refers very much back to the question I had here earlier here. This is an example of noise, right? Something is not clear. It goes through some kind of a filter, say, right? So here, what could be an example of this here? For instance, we observe the following example. Again, this wage equation here, because now I can build on that. Suppose now I want to fix wage. I want to add in this ability here. And to fix ability, because it's really hard to measure ability of a person. So as a proxy, we put in the IQ test. Great. Now we have a proxy for it. But the problem is IQ test comes with some noise, arguably. That is that it could be the size of this here, the higher your score or lower score, it becomes more and more noisy. Nice example here. Slowpoke tells me that he scored a 130 on his IQ test. It could be noisy, guys. Could be noisy. Beware of that. But my point is here, you could simply make a case for here. Say, look here, guys. If you estimate something that is not clear, that is, you're not sure that it's the correct values all the time, there's some kind of noise attached, you're conducting measurement error, and thereby you cannot get biased estimates. That's bad, of course. Of course, there's, of course, uh, other examples, and I've actually put here, these are the extra things I've included for this run of the course. So shameless self-promotion, because yes, I also dealt with it myself. I put in two publications here. 
One was my own master thesis, guys, so you can actually go and take a look at that. That's a rewritten version of my master thesis. Um, here we deal with measurement error through survey responses, because of course, people responding to a survey should be taken with a grain of salt. And especially when you ask people to recall something in the past, as we did in that survey. And here we argue, of course, that the further in the past you go, the more noisy it becomes. And then we have a discussion about, well, what is you know, something to be taken serious and not something to be taken serious? How can we argue for that our estimates are good enough, even though such a noise could exist? That's what I do in the first paper from 2015. In the second one here, for instance, I look at a type of, uh, I will call a type of measurement error, which I know known as social desirability bias. It's actually a survey response error. And what does it mean? It means if you ask somebody in a survey a question that can be perceived as sensitive, people could be likely to give you not their true answer, but rather the social desirable answer. Suppose I ask people in a survey on the street, or I go to the street and ask people, uh, are you taking drugs? It's a very extreme example, guys, but just to prove my point here. If I ask that in the street, it's not very likely that people who even who do it will answer me truthfully. They're more likely to say, no, of course not, because that's the social desirable answer. Now, there's different ways to disentangle this social desirability bias in order to, you know, get around this potential measurement error. And that's something I've been doing in the 2018 paper there. And uh, why do I include this here? This is just to give you an example of how we can get around such errors that we discuss here in this class here. And this may be seen shameless self-promotion, but I also believe in you should practice what you preach. So uh, that's why I included this here. So if you want to, the links are there if you want to check it out. Otherwise, there are, I would say, thousands of other articles out there uh, dealing with this here. So I think it's very important also that you understand what kind of things can be done. And there's a lot of things that can be done. I even wrote my entire PhD dissertation on this kind of stuff. So, uh, and that only scratched the surface, actually. So... Um, there's a lot of things here. This is some new examples I've included. So I hope that helps you guys. Now, let's go to the third one. Because now we had omitted variable bias and we had measurement error. Now let's reverse causality. That one is a, a real fun one. It's something that I have not dealt with very often until now. Because there's another paper I'm working on where we're actually dealing with it. And there's also an example I'll show you. But first, let's look at a more classical example. Sales as a function of advertisement. First of all, what is reverse causality even? That is basically saying, is Y a function of X or the other way around? Is X a function of Y? It's cases where you're actually not sure what is supposed to be a function of what. The example I give you here is sales and advertisement. So what we're saying here in this current model that I've written on screen now, see it up here, we see that sales is a function of advertisement. So for instance, that we get more sales with more advertisement. But some would also argue, we could also put it the other way around, right? So we can also have advertisement as a function of sales. And well, to argue this here can be rather hard. And there's a lot of theoretic argumentation here as well. So it should actually be something that's really fun to look at. A more, even more common example you may find out of textbooks is supply equal to demand, or is it demand equal to supply? That's also a really good discussion to read. But this is just to highlight, guys, this is a potential source of idogeneity. Here's another example. And this is a little more um, out-of-the-box example. But of course, like I said, uh, I was uh, recommended by previous students doing this course to include more practical examples. So following the word that I practice what I preach, I actually deal with in a working paper I have right now where... Believe it or not, I'm working with a sample of Pokemon players because it's rather fun to work with. Here we look at depression, actually. And the thing is here, you may think about, or what we are actually trying to argue here, is people being ruminators or depressed, a function of them playing Pokemon. So do I get depressed by playing Pokemon cards? Or could it be the other way around that, well... In this case here, I say like uh, depressed by playing Pokemon cards, or do you play Pokemon cards because you're depressed? Why is this even a uh, why is this even a consideration? After we did this survey that we used it that was done online, you can actually see the Pokemath here on episode uh, 44 and 46, where I actually launched the survey uh, together with uh, Colin Mole from United States, 
where we actually go over all these things and all these considerations. And uh, I decided to actually put that up in videos here to really are to really showcase all the steps we have to take and think about when you launch such a survey. But what we what we are faced with here is actually a reverse causality issue. So what I said is here: Do you become depressed by playing, or do you play because you're depressed? That's what we're trying to you know uh, argue our way out of. Still a working paper, and it's a lot of fun to do. And actually, we're also facing measurement error because it's a survey. But that's a completely different. Uh, um, discussion but the good thing is that one is already sorted so we're working on it let's go over to self-selection as the fourth one suppose you have the following one and let me also note here self-selection is still my most favorite one why because that was actually what got me into all the this here in the beginning when i first was studying this particular issue what does it do suppose you have an intervention any product any program or like I like to give an example of microcredit because that's where I actually started my entire thesis, right? So you have a group that is treated, so a treatment group, in this particular example, people who gain microcredit. You have a control group, that is people who do not get microcredit. And here, of course, you estimate the following. You have that indeed it is treated or untreated. And you can, of course, write it down here. It's a dummy variable. So you can see here you have either dummies equal to one if you're treated or zero if you're not. All this discussion of dummy variables and how to actually do this is a discussion for next week in lecture three. But the problem here is you will get what we call a self-selection bias if you have a correlation between the error term and your dummy here. What does that mean? That means that there's something we don't observe that makes a person more or less likely to self-select them into a given program. I'll give you an example with microcredit. You launch a microcredit program in a very poor village in Bangladesh, like was the original case with Muhammad Yunus, Yunus back in the 80s when he developed all this. So the thing was here, you launch in a very poor area. Who are the people who want to take up such a loan? Well, typically people who are A, very poor, can't get access to credit in a normal banking institute, and B, people who are more likely to have an entrepreneurial spirit. You know, people who are more likely to actually start up their own business, which was the purpose of such a loan. You can't observe or you don't observe such entrepreneurial spirit or motivation. Therefore, it goes out in the error, error term. And then suddenly you have that the error term has something that correlates with your decision to participate, thereby causing self-selection and also thereby showing that this is a special case of number one on the meta variable bias. I hope this makes sense because this is a cornerstone of a lot of things out there and also something I catch a lot of students about missing, uh, a lot of students missing in their master thesis. So very important guys, you check whether this is an issue. There's a lot of ways to get around it and other examples include, but not limited to, online surveys. That's something again, if you give a survey online, who's more likely to actually partake this uh, survey? You have to make these considerations or computer practicals. Let me work about a little about that one. This course contains computer practicals, for instance. They are not mandatory, and therefore we get a self-selection issue. If I were to estimate the impact of such practicals on your exam grade. <coughs> Why? Because there could be your skill level or your motivation level that I don't observe that will make you more or less likely to participate in such computer practical. So if I just would look at uh, does participating in computer practicals increase your grade at the end? That would be wrong if I don't try to control for these kind of things or try to control for self-selection bias. So please keep that in mind. That's just a yet another example of such self-selection bias. Okie dokie. We of course also have more examples of such and again, shamelessly self-promoting own publications, but again, practice what I preach. And therefore we can see here, again, we have uh, my entire dissertation written on this and also another a paper I published in 2019 uh, about, well, a similar thing where we try to control for self-selection bias. So if this is only for the interested reader and not example material advice, so this is only for if you're interested, of course. Now, with that said, we have one more left, and that is zero correlation in the presence of a lag dependent variable. And a good thing for you guys, we will not deal with that today. That will come back to that in lecture number four. So, um, I will cut that one short and jump straight over to how we can actually deal with these problems. I have already talked a bit about it here and there, 
But in general, the most classical way to do this is by using IV estimation. That is an instrumental variable estimation. So in the case of uh, the whole wage equation, and you didn't observability, you can use an instrument being the IQ test, for instance, or your parents' education level, which is also more commonly done. However, we don't deal with this course here, but there's many ways to do this. And it's a, I was gonna say it's complete science, which it is, but there's so many ways to do this. I just want to highlight, there are a lot of things and it'll be really cool for a topic for a master thesis, guys. So this is something you can think about when you're about to select what you're gonna write about to see if you can actually try to use one of these approaches or more. That will make for a fantastic thesis, I'm absolutely certain. So that's one thing. Now, we only got one little topic today and that I call that other issues. Other issues being multicollinearity. I both love and hate it at the same time. So I love it because it's pretty easy to deal with. I hate it because students, they keep making a big fuss about this one. And it's not a big fuss, guys, because it's uh, pretty straightforward how to deal with it. And it's very easy to check. So um, let's go around it here. And then after this one, we are done with today's lecture. So going on to this one here, multicollinearity. What is it? It comes in two flavors. It is comes in the problem flavor and a less problematic flavor. Let's call it like that. It's also known as perfect multicollinearity and near perfect multicollinearity. Let's start with the perfect one. That is that there exists an exact relationship between two or more variables in your model. I give an example here. Suppose in this little regression here that x3 is exactly just two times x2. There's, there's an exact two to one relationship here. That is a case of perfectly multicollinearity or perfect multicollinearity. Ugh, long word, I know. If you would estimate something like that, Stats would actually automatically drop it for you. That's good, right? That's why it's actually not really a problem because it gets fixed automatically. You don't even have to do anything. The real problem part here comes with near multicollinearity. Why is it a problem? Because Stats doesn't automatically drop it for you. You would have to note it, uh, notice it yourself. So the thing is here, you have that between two or more variables, you have a high correlation, but not perfect. So it's near perfect, say, right? What do you get? You get an artificially high R squared, but the individual coefficients in your model would have very high standard errors. That is that they will probably be insignificant as a result of this very high standard errors, right? Because the higher the standard errors, the smaller the T stats, the smaller the T stats, the higher the P value, and the more likely you are to not reject your hypothesis. And what also happens is that the regression that you do run becomes very, very sensitive to even the smallest changes in the specification. So if you have something that is say 90% correlated there, so instead of being perfectly, they're just 90% correlated, you will get the problems listed here. And that's really problematic because you would have to notice it yourself. The good thing is, like I said, it's easy to notice. So how do we deal with it if we measure it? The easiest way to fix it and notice it is simply just to put up a correlation matrix. Simple as that. So you put up a correlation matrix of all, of all your independent variables, not your dependent one. So all your independent variables, so x1, x2, x3 in this case, and then you notice what's the problem. So you do like following. You put up this nice little correlation matrix and you notice now, oh, in this little example here, x2 and x4 are highly correlated. Hmm, highly meaning 80 in this case. I think that's pretty high. Although there's a lot of ambiguity here, but I would argue that an A08 correlation is really high, absolute value of course, because it doesn't matter whether it's minus 080 or 080, it's both equally bad. So how do we deal with it? Hmm, first of all, you can ignore it. I wouldn't recommend that. That's of course, if this only is a lot lower than this, then I would recommend it. But in the case here, ignoring it, that's one thing. For other reasons, hey guys, could you uh, come with some suggestions? So anybody watching this out there in the chat, what are other ways we can deal with this? Just to see if anybody's awake out there. So any other ways we can deal with multicollinearity? What do you think? I got the whopping amount of 18 people watching. So who guys, you can uh, 
you should be able to, one or two of you should be able to whip up a suggestion or two. What can we do? Well, we can drop them. Yeah, that's definitely something. So that's from Bard. I will give you one there. That's definitely true. We can just drop it. That's the easy thing. That's also one of the reasons why I say this is easy. We can combine them. That's certainly also something. And that could be, for instance, we just divide them, generate a ratio. So you transform two variables into one. There's, of course, multiple ways of combining them. We can also do different analysis types. So let me look at that here. What do we do? Let's check it here. What we can do is drop one of them. That's indeed like Bart said. Very good. We can transform them. That is, for instance, we can take in our little case here, x2 divided by x4, generate a ratio. That's one way. Or we can do a principal component slash factor analysis. In this particular case here, that will make sure we find an underlying factor, and we can just include this underlying factor instead of both variables. And of course, there exists also other summary index techniques that can take a large number of variables and sum them down into, well, less. Again, I've also done that in one of my previous papers and also my master thesis because I thought this was a really cool technique. That's why I used it and it turned out to be a really good idea. So you can also find that in Ericsson and Lensing from 2015. Now, this is a, that should actually cover what we have here for today. So I think with that said, that was all, guys. So I hope you enjoyed today's class. And well, I hopefully, of course, to see you back here for another class in Stefan's classroom. <laughs>